welcome to the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative National Briefing Webinar uh, entitled, What Can Employers Do to Support Primary Care Practice Transformation? I am thrilled that you are joining us today. Uh, this is our March National Briefing, as I mentioned, and this is a, a terrific opportunity for us to share with you an issue brief uh, that we developed in partnership with the National Business Group on Health. Um, we've been partnering with them for some time, uh, and this was an opportunity for our employer and purchaser center uh, to do some collaboration uh, with folks at the National Business Group on Health, looking specifically at what employers um, can do to get engaged in this uh, very important topic uh, as we try to advance primary care as part of this bigger, broader health system um, reform. And before we Excuse me, before we begin, I'd like to go over a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Um, first, uh, you'll notice in the report itself, which you should have a, a link to uh, in, in your um, invitation to join us for the webinar, um, you'll see that the issue brief um, mentions the, the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative Evidence Report. Uh, so if you haven't seen that particular document, uh, we do hope that, that you take a look at it um, and, and we, you will have an opportunity uh, to see some of the data that I think uh, we'll be talking to uh, in a bit more detail today. And then secondly, um, as many of you know, uh, the PCPCC is a not-for-profit membership organization. Um, we've got a lot of things going on right now to advance primary care payment reform, not the least of them. Uh, and if you would like to know more about the PCPCC and consider joining us as an executive member, uh, we'd love to have you. So please contact Amanda Holt on our team. And then finally, uh, the webinar software that we use uh, allows you to ask questions and provide comments. Uh, but to do that, um, you need to submit your questions in writing using the drop-down question box that's on your screen. Then the last 15 minutes of, of the webinar, we're going to open uh, this, this conversation up to all of you and, and ask and answer some of the questions uh, that, that you'd like to pose. And as always, uh, we do make these, um, these slides and the recorded presentation available about 24 hours after the presentation. Uh, so please, if you aren't um, uh, able to, to uh, have your colleagues join you today, send them a link uh, to the um, presentation and they can listen to it later. So uh, without further ado, as I've mentioned, and uh, Amanda, if you would go ahead and advance that slide. Um, if, if um, For those of you who pay a lot of attention to the various struggles that employers have in trying to support delivery system reform, you'll realize um, that that their interest in this area has not waned, but employers uh, have been diverted uh, with many of the, the, the things that they need to focus on relative to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and, and so there was a, there was a lot of activity um, really in 2009, 2010 around delivery reform in, in the world of employers. Um, but, but some of that focus was shifted, and, and it is beginning to shift back. Um, we have uh, two folks today that I would like to introduce you to who can speak to some of, of their experience in that regard. Uh, Brenna, Brenna uh, Havilland Shabel is the Director of Healthcare Costs and Delivery at the National Business Group on Health. Uh, she has long been working in, in this space uh, and has a background working uh, with, with uh, consumers' education in particular uh, with her community health education and health policy and management degree. Um, Matt Morrison is the Executive Director of Healthcare Operations at MGM Resorts International. He is also one of the leaders of our employer purchaser center. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we have been uh, focused on this issue of how to engage employers for some time. Uh, and, and I think this particular issue brief uh, outlines nicely what, what the issues are, what employers are asking us, and that is going to provide us um, with, with a view from an employer who didn't uh, divert their attention away from delivery reform when, when the requirements of the Affordable Care Act were, were um, being rolled out. Uh, they doubled down 
on delivery reform and focusing in particular on primary care and TCMH. Um, he, he brings a wealth of experience to this topic um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, MGM, longtime um, leader in this space and a member, an executive member of the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative. Um, so, um, beginning first uh, with, with Brenna, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, the National Business Group on Health and why you felt uh, that, that this brief was important at this point in time. Then we'll, we'll switch to Matt, who's going to, um, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, spell out what MGM has been doing. They're highlighted in the issue brief. And then I'll kind of recap what we've, what we've learned doing this issue brief uh, and, and uh, answer, uh, ask and answer questions uh, at the end of the presentation. So with that, Brenna, welcome. Thank you for being here, and thank you for NBGH's leadership on this front. Great. Thanks so much, Marcy. And hello, everyone. I'm so pleased to be on today's call and to share this really exciting resource with you all. Um, as Marcy had mentioned, I am from the National Business Group on Health. We're a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. And we're a membership organization, just like PCPCC. Um, but we're made up of large employers, so our membership is mostly Fortune 500 companies. And we work within those companies with those um, responsible for health benefits, wellness programs, and productivity programs. So we're working with those who influence the way healthcare is delivered to employees all around the country and all around the world. So I thought it would be really important to uh, express an understanding of why we partnered with PCPCC and why this topic was really important and timely for the business group to publish in early of 2016. So back in fall of 2014, um, Marcy had presented to one of our smaller employer groups, uh, a group of employers who are very interested and enthusiastic about payment and delivery reform. And she shared the evidence reports um, back in the fall of 2014 evidence report, and that really sparked a fire with our members. The fact that there was evidence tied back to patient-centered medical homes was so exciting for them, and it was coming from a credible organization like PCPCC. So we sort of began down our journey here to help employers understand what is delivery reform and what does it mean to them. Uh, last year, we created an executive committee on value purchasing. And that group is really focused on ACOs. Um, and when we dug a little deeper with that group, they really pushed our organization, the business group, to look more into um, patient-centered medical homes and how can primary care infrastructure further support ACOs. So on top of that, we speak a lot with our members around these topics. And we heard a lot of very legitimate concerns around PCMHs. People sort of felt like this, these are just HMOs for, for the new century, basically. Um, we're back in the old, old game of working through uh, health maintenance organizations, and this has just rebranded a brand new acronym for us to figure out. And so we wanted to listen to our members and respond appropriately by providing them evidence-based factual information on delivery reform. So when we were sort of rolling around and working with PCPCC, when we learned that they were updating their evidence reports and that these great strong results would be coming out around the evidence and the outcomes of patient-centered medical homes, we got very excited. We wanted to get this information out to our members. And we knew our members wanted it. There was no reason for the business group to try to go down the same road that PCPCC went down. And so we came together to really form a partnership to bring all of that intelligence from PCPCC to our membership, to large employers, so they would have a good understanding of what the outcomes and evidence is around, around this topic. We also have a, a sort of common members. So uh, organizations like MGM uh, Resorts and others work both with PCPCC and the business group. So it made most sense that we partner together to deliver the information that they were asking for. We know that there is a really broad spectrum of where employers are in adopting payment and delivery reform. Often they are sort of uh, following the lead of their health plans that may be a PCMH or an ACO is being implemented by a national carrier that they have employees subscribed to, and they're sort of following along with what's, what's going on. There are some employers 
like MGM, is really leading the way, doing a lot of really exciting, innovative things, and really pushing the market. And so recognizing that employers are all over the spectrum. Some haven't even gone down this road yet. They're just still understanding what PCPCs are. We felt we need to create a brief um, with PCPCC to, to help them understand what delivery of form is and specifically patient-centered medical homes. And so the brief, which Marcy's going to get into much more detail later in the call, really achieves four things. First, we wanted to provide basic education and understanding to employers, create a baseline understanding of what are PCM agents. Then we wanted to present the evidence from PCPCC's evidence report that came out earlier this year. And then thirdly, we wanted to address those common employer concerns. You know, again, they think these may be HMOs all over again. They're very concerned about where their care coordination fees are going. They feel like they're paying for really exciting practice transformation, but their employees aren't in the practices that are making the transformation. And so they're very concerned about where their money is going and if actually their workforce is going to be reaping those rewards. And on top of that, we have to leave employers with recommendations on how to get started, which Marcy's going to go through as well. So it's a really exciting partnership, very exciting report. I'm very thrilled to be here with you today to, to bring it to you. I will disclose, I was not the original author of this report. My colleagues are in another meeting, um, and I, I hate that they can't be here because this is a really exciting time for them. But I do want to credit um, Dylan Landers Nelson and Sherry Davidson from the National Business Group on Health, who really spearheaded this work, working with Tara and uh, Marcy. So with that, uh, Marcy, I'll turn it back over to you, and I'll be on the call the entire time if anyone has questions at the end. Thank you so much, Brenna. That was a perfect setup, I think, uh, for for Matt, as um, he has been on on all of the journeys of which you speak. Uh, experience with with managed care in in the '90s. Uh, he has has been at a large employer, um, which of course is is the kind of membership that NBGH has, and a large employer that that really is cutting edge, and they have been at, at the PCPCC's um, uh, table uh, for, for a long time following, following delivery reform opportunities and deciding what they can best do for, for their employees and, and their um, employees' dependents, and, and uh, Matt, we are thrilled to have you. Um, thank you so much for um, being with us, and why don't you tell us about the journey that MGM has been on? Thank you. I'll be happy to. Uh, first off, again, uh, uh, I want to thank both the National Business Group on Health and the Patient Center Primary Care Collaborative. As, as was mentioned, we're, we're members of both, and, and both have been tremendous resources for us as, as we've tried to really make a difference um, for our employees and their dependents in terms of their own health care, and then also make a difference for uh, the region in, in which they work and um, hopefully have a positive influence for other employers. Uh, I'm, my primary focus today is, is what we've uh, dubbed the direct care health plan. Uh, it, this has been kind of my baby for the last five years. Uh, we started the, the design of it back in 2011 and implemented it in 2012. So this baby's uh, in about kindergarten now. And I think we have some uh, really uh, exciting results that I, want to, I would love to share with all of you. Uh, first off, at a high level, just to talk about MGM Resorts International, uh, to dispel the common notion, it, uh, we do have more than just the MGM grant. Um, currently, uh, we have properties up and down the Las Vegas Strip, uh, roughly half of them. Uh, we're the largest private employer in the state of Nevada with over 52,000 employees. Um, half of those are covered by union plans, and uh, we work pretty closely with the union uh, with, with their initiatives for them. But uh, 22,000 are eligible for our MGM Resorts benefits, um, uh, and one of the plans offered under that benefit is this direct care health plan. So this is kind of the starting point for us and, and why we felt that we needed to find a way to make improvements um, for both our employees and the region. Um, at the time that we were looking to make these changes, Nevada ranked 47th in terms of healthcare quality. 
Uh, you can see uh, on this slide some of the areas that we were below average and also um, some of the areas that we were above average in um, and all of which are areas that you don't want to be below or above average in. Uh, so in order to address these, um, we went and uh, did a lot of research. The uh, resources available from the PC, PCC at the time were uh, tremendously valued to us. Uh, and we, based on that information and information from others, we thought that really reinforcing the role of primary care and adopting tenants of the patient center medical home would be key uh, in order for us to uh, uh, make improvements and and to really you know drive value for the, the our company's healthcare spend. So these are I, I called this slide the PCP PCMH inspired tenants because I didn't want to to let on like it was fully inclusive, but these are these are ones that we really latched on to. So we wanted to have designated primary care providers um, leading a team of, uh, of, of you know, either MAs or even front office staff or whoever else would, would work to really drive engagement, close gaps in care, and really get our members the care that they need. Um, another key element for us was enhanced access to care for patients. Uh, I showed some of the stats for Nevada, but also Something that's kind of unique for our region is that our, our primary care physicians, on average, were getting paid about 65% of Medicare rates. And as a result of that, the economics uh, dictated that many of them had to see you know, 40, 50 patients a day. Uh, they, there was little proactive outreach. Oftentimes, you get the scenario where the doctor couldn't take their, their hand off the, the, the handle to the door of the exam room. Um, and it often it actually incentivized uh, additional testing in order to drive revenue and you know keep their business up and running. Uh, so that's something that we wanted to really address through this program. Uh, integrated technology. Uh, we as an employer uh, have used what was then MedStat, now Truven, for 13 years now, uh, which provided us a tremendous amount of data. Um, about uh, the healthcare utilization and, and how we might try to address it from an employer standpoint, but we recognize that that data would be even more valuable in the hands of the caregivers. So we implemented po population health management software, provided that to the PCPs under this plan, and also uh, re online referral tools to enable proactive uh, or interaction between the uh, primary care physicians and the specialists that they're referring to. And so, you know, in that way, we're, we're leveraging technology to put data in the hands of those of the pros, so to speak, those that can really use it. We wanted to have uh, KPIs for quality, access, and cost, kind of the, the iron triangle of healthcare, the triple aim, and we want to address both sides of it. and, and use those to really hold both the providers and the patients accountable because you know for, we can try to incentivize the providers as much as, as we want but if the, the patients never really get engaged and aren't doing what the provider says then we're going to see a limited results from our efforts and then we're uh, I mentioned that 65 percent of Medicare rate we wanted to make sure that we had a compensation program that really recognized the value of primary care and the impact that it has on our members. So this is a quick rundown of the incent both the incentives and the requirements for the primary care providers and under the plan. Uh, when we rolled the plan out in 2012, we had 18 primary care for providers. Uh, we had been offering a self-funded PPO plan, so essentially we took the exact same network of hospital specialists ancillaries from the PPO network just removed the primary care providers and replaced them with 18. We're up to 28 now um, due to the growth of the plan. So for those primary care providers, they get enhanced reimbursement um, that kind of follows the PCMH uh, game plan where they get a monthly care management fee to cover uh, the use of the population health management tools, the proactive outreach. They get global visit fees. Uh, our, our big push was to pay for time and not test. 
So this uh, incentivizes them. They, you know, when the member is in, or the patient is in their office, they're in, uh, they get the resources necessary to spend the appropriate amount of time with them, and then there are no um, adverse incentives uh, to, do, to provide any more care than is actually necessary. Uh, there are two bonuses. Uh, after uh, working back and forth with those initial 18 PCPs, we determined it was, it was best to, to offer two sets of bonuses. The first benchmark bonus uh, is given out if they uh, just meet the goals that we've set at the beginning of the year. So this gives them a set of uh, kind of uh, securities, per se, that if at least if I do this much, then I will get this bonus. Um, we, but we didn't want them to stop there. We wanted them to be incentivized to exceed those bonuses, uh, so we have implemented a peer comparison bonus. So uh, if they're in the top quartile among their peers, they get uh, one level bonus. The second quartile gets a little lower bonus. Third quartile is a little lower than that, and the fourth quartile doesn't get any of the peer comparison bonus. So in that way, they know that if they at least hit the marks, they get something, but if they they really excel, they'll get something more. Uh, a nice uh, a feature for them is that there's no prior authorization for covered services. Um, they're accountable for the overall cost efficiency uh, for the panel, patients on their panels. And then if there are any issues, then we just look for um, exceptions on the back end. That enhanced access I talked about earlier. Um, I'll have more on that later, but uh, that's been a, a key aspect of the program. We wanted to have a dedicated phone line for our members uh, to help facilitate that enhanced access so that they know they're in direct care uh, as soon as they call. And then uh, I briefly spoke about the population health management and the referral technology uh, that we provided to them in order to get the, the data into their hands. Now, each of these primary care physicians on the plan gets a monthly scorecard from us that lets them know how they're doing in the areas of quality, access, and cost. And then in addition to that upfront scorecard that actually gives them a ranking of where they sit compared to their peers, there's additional uh, detail um, to provide that actionable information. So if their colorectal cancer screening levels are low, they know exactly who's on their panel that, has, that is overdue for screening so that they can do that proactive outreach. For plan members, there are also incentives and requirements. So we offer those three options. Uh, I mentioned the PPO plan, which is self-funded, and then also a fully insured HMO, which only has about 6% of our enrollment right now. Uh, it offers the lowest cost plan design, no deductible, low co-pays, very um, transparent uh, pricing for the members. Uh, that enhanced access I talked about where they get same or next day appointments for sick visits and they're guaranteed with less than a 30 minute wait time from their on-time arrival. This has been huge for them. The members, uh, it's an incentive for them to join the plan and they in this town, there's a lot of focus on being a VIP and for concierge care, but really uh, the reason why we wanted to focus on access is, is we wanted our members to build a relationship with the primary care physician, and we felt that the inability to make appointment or two-hour wait times would just lead to more urgent care, ER visits, you know, walk-in clinic visits, which while they may help, it breaks up the, the continuity of care and it's hard for the PCP to actually, you know, stay on top of, of their membership with the, and their conditions. Uh, for a long time, we had a focus on uh, annual physicals, and that was actually one of the requirements for the plan up front. Uh, and when they had that annual physical, we actually gave them a day off to do it. Um, it's called the Wellness Floating Holiday. Uh, we've since streamlined that even more as the direct care plan became even more popular. And, and at the same time, we've kind of lessened the focus on the physicals. So members of the direct care health plan actually get an extra day off during the year where they can uh, either go see the primary care physician or they could go play golf either way. Uh, they, they have the health score uh, that's referenced on the bottom bullet of this slide where they get credits related to their, uh, for their paycheck contributions by completing that score, and part of uh, getting that score is getting a physical um, at least every other year. 
So they have incentives to still see their physician, but we've given them flexibility to use that day however they want. A little more about that health score program. Like I said, we moved away from just having a physical. We wanted to move toward, more towards an outcomes-based program that really incentivized people to not only know what they need to do and to improve their health, but also take the action to do it. Uh, we uh, partnered with um, Lifetime Fitness, and we're actually using their scorecard program. It's on a 100-point scale. It looks at the, the usual uh, risk factors. Um, it's a very simple two-page scorecard. We wanted to keep it as simple as possible because even though these members were going in and getting physicals with, with their, their primary care physicians on a regular basis, it's often you know, hard for the layperson to, to know what a good triglyceride is and, and, and the difference between total cholesterol and HDL. So this report card breaks it down for them into simple low-risk, moderate-risk, high-risk terms, and then um, uh, displays that on a 100-point scale so it's easy to, to, for them to determine how they're doing on an overall basis. Uh, like I said, they're incentivized to both get that scorecard by visiting with their primary care physician, and then they also get an additional outcomes-based credit, uh, which is double that, that uh, participation credit if they have any of those three outcomes listed on the slide, either a score above 70, showing improvement, or visiting with a wellness coach. Now, the wellness coaches uh, program, um, those are also provided by Lifetime. And we have wellness coaches on our each of the properties on the Las Vegas Strip. And then we've also recently expanded by using uh, Lifetime's um, fitness centers here in our region to provide coaching to spouses at their centers out in the community so that spouses don't have to try to deal with traffic on the Strip and, and finding a wellness coach in the back of the house at our properties. So those coaches are available to employees and spouses, and we've actually actually built them into that specialist referral tool so that when PCPs have someone that they think would benefit from coaching, they can just use that tool to refer them over, and they'll handle you know exercise counseling, dietary counseling, and even smoking cessation. So results, that's what everybody wants to know. How's it worked? So we rolled out in 2012, as I mentioned, um, about 12% of the enrollees or possible uh, health plan enrollees selected it at that time. As you can see, it's become very popular where it's, it's uh, by far uh, has the highest enrollment of each of the three health plans that we offer. Um, the Even though the membership has climbed, uh, we've kept the the additional primary care providers to a minimum so that we can, we've in, in essence tripled the average panel size per PCP and ma making this plan more and more meaningful to them in their office and their operations. From a cost perspective, we, we are seeing an increase in outpatient spend naturally because uh, we're paying the, both the primary care physicians a little more, but they're also making sure that people are getting their diabetic screenings, their cancer screenings, and all of that costs money. So uh, we consider that good spend, and that good spend has been more than offset by decreases in inpatient spend. So we're seeing 20% fewer ER visits, 35% fewer medical and surgical inpatient days as compared to that PPO plan that's using the same, nearly the same network. Uh, and then we're actually seeing a 2% greater generic dispensing rate in the direct care plan versus the PPO, which is helping to keep our pharmacy spend actually below the PPO, even though scripts per thousand meet or exceed those under the PPO plan. Um, since we've rolled out, annual cost trends have been, have been nearly flat. We've only seen 1% to 2% annual increases when looking at the direct care and PPO plan combined, but most of that has been due to inflation under the PPO plan. Uh, the access that I mentioned, that kind of VIP concierge level care, we have an online survey for, survey for the members to take to let us know how their PCP is doing. Currently, we're in 89% overall satisfaction rate with 71% reporting uh, waiting 15 minutes or less to see their PCP. From a quality perspective, we look at diabetics. Currently, 70% um, have an A1C that's in good control or under 8. 
77% have a blood pr pressure in good control or, or lower than 140 over 90. And then the diabetic screen rate chart below shows the impact that those that influx of members has caused. So we show the the screening rate as of January 2012 and then up to the end of the year back to January 13 when we get a big influx of members and then back up you know where that rate is restored at the end of the year uh, based on the the efforts of the primary care physician so uh, the the initial measures of looking at the A1C of 62 percent that gives us a, a good idea of the baseline under the PPO plan and we've been able to keep that growing, uh, keep that high over time so that more and more of our employee population, of our membership is uh, up to date on their diabetic screening. The same is true for cancer. Um, in each of these three cancer categories, we, we exceed uh, NCQA 75th percentile for com commercial payers. So with that, I hope I left enough time and I was able to move all through those slides fast enough, but I want to thank everyone that's attended and I, I look forward to any questions and feedback you may have later on. So thanks again and I'll hand it over, back over to you, Marcy. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, as, as you know, I get um, giddy about the, the results that, that you uh, have been sharing with us from MGM. And um, I guess I, the question or two that I wanted uh, to pose before we answered some of the more global concerns that, that Brenna uh, was suggesting that that um, employers have writ large. When, when I listened to you uh, share the details about your program, and, and I've um, been meeting with you and your team to talk about the, the results, Obviously, you're looking at the whole triple aim, um, and and you're using lots of different measures. I guess I have I have one comment, and then and then a question. My my comment is: we so often run into the question of does does this model work? And um, it's a it's a fair question, and uh, we're still trying to understand which components of of the model are sort of the most compelling based on the population of patients or, or the kinds of care teams that are providing the care, et cetera. Um, but we get asked a lot of questions about methodology and evaluation. And um, every time I, I talk with folks from MGM, I come away thinking, while it's important to have the scientific evidence and, and if it's published in a peer-reviewed journal, all, all the better, but employers themselves care deeply about the health of their employees. They care deeply about cost effectiveness of, of care. And you're in the business of, of tracking outcomes, as, as you point out, in, at MGM as, a, as an institution. You are very focused on VIP treatment. And accordingly, you want to provide VIP treatment to your employees. So I'm just making sort of a global comment, which is even when some of these um, some of these initiatives aren't aren't evaluated um, in a in a gold standard kind of way. Um, the employers that are offering these kinds of plans are indeed tracking outcomes. Um, uh, again, you all are ahead of the pack. But can you say more in that regard? Um, separating some of the some of the quality measures aside, and and certainly the cost measures that matter. Um, do you have any kind of qualitative anecdotes for us about your employees and how they like the program um, and or what, what they thought they wouldn't like, things that you were worried about um, that, that maybe you're not worried about anymore, things that you didn't think would, would be a problem that in fact um, are a problem now, now, that you're, um, now that you've got a kindergartner on your hand in terms of your direct uh, primary care program? Yeah, I think uh, uh, to, to answer your question about some of the upfront concerns, um, we wanted, to, uh, as we rolled this out, uh, we wanted to take kind of an organic approach and let it grow on its own based on its own merit. Uh, so that's why you see the gradual increases in enrollment over time, you know, versus just making whole scale changes and um, uh, completely changing the health plan options available to our members. Uh, 
one of our concerns of the perception of, of direct care up front was that people would consider it to be like an HMO because anytime our members hear PCPs and that you have to get a referral to specialist, they think HMO. And so we have to, you know, really make sure that they know that there's no, um, that these PCPs are completely trusted. There's no, again, I mentioned the pre-authorization, but there's no authorization of their referrals either. So we tell members over and over again, if you go see your PCP and they determine that you need to see a cardiologist, you can go see that cardiologist the same day. The PCP just enters it into the referral tool online and it's done, and that just makes sure that the claim gets paid accordingly. So we've, we've been able to overcome some of that HMO stigma um, and also by really stressing the enhanced access and really working with the PCPs over and over again. We meet with each of them about every other month to make sure that they're providing that because the, the, some of the negative connotations to HMOs, and obviously some, some are great, some are better than others, um, is that once you get an HMO, you're not going to be able to get in to see your doctor. And so, uh, again, our, our push towards providing that kind of enhanced level of access isn't just to make them feel good, but to make sure that they're actually getting the care when they need it, right time, right place. Um, the, the added benefit of that is often in our surveys, we, you know, we have spouses submitting surveys with comments saying, I've told my spouse that they have to stay at MGM because we love this insurance so much and I wouldn't want anything else. And so from a, a employee relations and from a retention standpoint, there are added benefits to really um, looking at access in addition to the overall quality of care and cost. And, and given how competitive the marketplace is uh, in Nevada, in Las Vegas, that's probably Pretty, uh, pretty darn important to uh, the management at MGM. Yeah, we have um, a pretty low turnover rate, and uh, um, it's you know during the recession it, it wasn't as important as it is now that you know, things are kind of picking up and, and new properties are again under construction, and you know there will be more competition for you know quality um, quality employees. Um, I, I, I think that that too, I mentioned earlier that uh, employers had shifted their gaze some uh, after the ACA passed and they had a number of other requirements that needed to uh, pay attention to other than delivery reform. But I think um, your suggestion um, is, is right on, which is it, it's not just that employers are, are catching with, with all those requirements, but but the economy has picked up, and, and with that, uh, competition for good employees gets tight, uh, and having a kind of, of health care delivery for employees and dependents um, that, that is patient-centered, employee-centered, uh, is important. I, I want to be certain that I have an opportunity to go through some of the, the more pressing questions that employers uh, asked Brenna and, and Sherry and Dylan. Uh, and, and then uh, we'll open this up to Q&A with the audience, and, and I do invite people to go ahead and type in some, some of the, the questions that, that they have for, for either of you. Um, the first question that um, I, I think, and, and there are a series of, of, of them here, all of these questions are both asked and then answered uh, in, in the issue brief uh, that, that NBGH and, and PCPCC uh, wrote. But, but I just wanted to highlight what, what I think the four sort of themes were, and, and Matt, you spoke actually to all of these. Um, so, so the first is, are the care coordination fees just adding extra costs uh, to the healthcare system? Um, you point out um, and, and I guess this won't be an exact quote, um, but you said that the, the fees uh, involved in paying for more primary care up front, your outpatient visits went up, um, but, but it was more than offset by, by the inpatient hospitalization costs. And so care coordination fees are just one mechanism 
by which uh, patient-centered medical homes are, are, are able to get paid for some of the requisite infrastructure costs. Um, they're very important because the, the, the changes that we're asking these practices to make are, are, are fairly, um, fairly large, lots of change, lots of uh, potential disruption, um, and, and they're, they're expensive. Um, but then you underscored another point that um, I think is, is really important for those primary care teams who are out there trying to do this work. And that is if you're only making 69 cents on the dollar um, relative to reimbursement rates uh, in primary care um, that, that are being paid by, by Medicare, doing this kind of work is untenable. Um, we've got to be paying better in primary care if, if we want to have primary care providers get off that sort of hamster wheel and, and be able to focus on their patients. And so a hats off to MGM for, for investing in the primary care workforce as a means to invest in, in their own employees. Um, other, other ways in which uh, NBGH um, suggests to their employers that, that these extra costs um, aren't, aren't, um, aren't a detriment Many employers, understandably frustrated with how much they're already paying for health care. Um, one of the things that, that NBJH uh, stresses is that you know PCMHs are, are really more startups than anything, and startups need investment. Um, and, and there's there's enough waste in the system right now. Nearly every study that that looks at this um, in any sort of um, detailed way finds between. 20 and 50 percent of, of all healthcare delivery is underuse, overuse, or misuse. So we point to, on average, about 30 percent waste in, in our system. When you can get rid of that waste, because you've incentivized this, this relationship that, that Matt was speaking to, the relationship between the primary care provider and that employee, um, they know what's best. You don't need to have util utilization review and lots of bureaucratic hurdles for, for the primary care provider to, to send their, uh, their, their patient, the employee, on to a specialist. Um, I think the final point that is important uh, to, to make is we're in, we're in the midst of a transition here. Um, the, the large insurers have, have already largely shifted to this model in their fully insured business lines. So the importance of employers getting in the game and, and getting behind this model allows an insurer to shift all of their business to this, to this model and makes it far easier for, for the employee, uh, for, for, the, for the practice team to, to, to adhere to um, minimum administrative hassle because there's, there's a limited number of payment methodologies and performance measures. That alignment is, is critically important. And um, that leads to, to question number two here. Am I paying for practice transformation that mostly benefits patients slash employees outside of, of, of my set of employees? Um, and, and the answer that NBGH provides to, to their employers, um, I, I, I appreciate that standard. The answer to a certain extent is yes. When a practice decides to transform to this model of care, it's for all their patients. It is an entire different way of, of doing business from, as, as Matt, you suggested, from the medical assistant who is, who is greeting the patient at the door um, through the referral system to, to specialists. Everything changes in a truly transformed practice. Um, so are there employers who are paying for this model of care for for other patients who, who, whose employers may not be? Um, in, in some respects, yes. But as we see more and more employers embrace this model, um, it is the rising tide that will ultimately float all boats. Matt, you mentioned that, that you do this not only for the health of your employees and their dependents, but also for the community. And, and, and so I do think that this is a, a community good uh, that, that employers can, can offer. Um, I, I do think it's it's important to be candid um, to the employers that that um, in terms of employer reporting, um, 
the employers would love to have from a primary care practice, just tell me how my patients are, are, are doing. Um, depending on the size of the employer, that, that's, that, that's sometimes really a challenge because sample sizes uh, are, are too small for that sort of employer specific reporting, um, which, which um, I think leads to the, to the final question on this list, um, and, and I'll come back to it here in, in a moment. Um, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on this, are PCMHs and, and uh, accountable care organizations just HMO light? Um, Matt, when I asked you the question uh, about sort of um, things that you were worried about going into the rollout of, of your program, you mentioned, a, 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 I'll use the term, a stigma uh, around uh, HMOs and what that might mean for employee pushback on wanting to have this kind of program. Um, so the good news is, no, that these PCMHs and ACOs aren't just HMO lights, although I do have to stop for a minute and laugh at, at all the acronyms in this sentence. My parents um, wouldn't know what any of the three meant. Um, the bottom line is, this is, a, this is a paradigm shift in how we deliver care. and, and um, that means it, it takes some time, um, but in, in, in contrasting what happened in the, in the late 1990s with, with the kinds of reforms we have now, there are things we have at our fingertips that we didn't have then. Now we have technology that allows us to do all kinds of population health management that, that we were unable to do in the 90s. That same technology gives us access to quality data that we didn't have in the 90s. And the way in which we managed um, the care under an HMO, uh, Matt, you, you kept referring back to um, uh, ways in which we'd asked uh, PPOs in, or um, um, PCPs in the past to really kind of limit the care. Maybe um, they used this term back in the day, sort of ration the care through a utilization review process. That's really not the case. In, in, in most um, patient-centered medical homes and, and ACO models. Um, we want to use primary care as, as the gateway to care versus being the gatekeeper. Um, and, and the final piece that's very important to providers themselves is this question around who's carrying the risk. Um, you mentioned you didn't just flip a switch and say, uh, okay, we're shifting our entire workforce into this new model of, of care, whether you like it or not. Um, it's hard to do that to providers as well. So shifting them from a fee-for-service world um, to, to a world in which they're provided with, with uh, capitation um, could, be, could, be, um, could be for all of primary care uh, uh, capitation. I important to determine the extent to which that primary care practice can, in fact, carry that risk. Um, it used to be we flipped that switch in the HMO days and primary care practices were unable to carry that risk. So um, thankfully, we are, we are uh, transitioning a, a little more slowly for those practices that can carry the risk when they're in a marketplace uh, that provides uh, full risk capitation. They're all in, but lots of primary care practices are only getting ramped up. Um, and, then, and then back to this question of is, is my population too small in, in a given market to succeed? Um, is critical mass uh, essential? You know, the, the, the notion here is that even if you're a small employer, um, it's sometimes hard to either drive uh, your health plan or a primary care practice to do things differently. But lots of employers actually have, have different avenues to partner with, with other payers. Um, uh, you'll see mentioned in the issue brief a focus on uh, multi-payer collaboratives happening in, in a number of, of states. Um, many employers join healthcare purchasing coalitions available in, in um, many, many uh, states, particularly in larger size cities. Um, employers might specifically direct incentives to a, to a select patient-centered medical home practice or group of, of practices. Um, and, and of course, this, um, this idea of communicating clearly um, and, and in multiple ways to your employees about the benefits of, of primary care uh, and, and PCMH. 
Um, this, this third model, not, not to conflict with the direct primary care um, that you're speaking to, Matt, but this, but this notion of direct, direct practices, um, DPCs, um, direct practice care uh, is, is growing. Um, lots of areas of the country, we've got primary care practices who, who actually don't take health insurance at all, but, but they partner directly with employers uh, to provide care to employees, uh, and sometimes to, to, uh, they, they, um, they provide a service to individuals uh, who pay a monthly fee. So recommended and, and alternative strategies for employers, um, coming back to, to Brenna's um, uh, overview, you know, they wanted this issue brief, um, as, as she stated, to begin with some baseline information on what patient-centered homes are. Uh, certainly, um, the, the, the evidence brief, I, I think, succeeds in that regard, and we've got lots more information at the PCPCC. Um, but the second thing they wanted to do is, is point to the evidence for, for what's working around PCMH. And, and again, I, I said at the outset of this call, our evidence report from this year, um, it's as, it's as um, uh, encouraging as it's ever been uh, in that 30 different studies this year spoke specifically um, to, to the evidence around uh, patient-centered medical homes and, and their impact on cost uh, and utilization. Um, uh, then you wanted to, to overtly address the, the concerns that um, we, we just went through in, in, in the issue brief, um, but you wanted uh, your employers to, to have uh, recommendations at the end of the day for, for what they might do um, with all this information. Um, and you outlined, um, we together, um, outlined the, the following six um, uh, kinds of recommendations uh, for employers to embrace primary care, patient-centered medical homes as, as a strategy to improve health uh, and, and improve cost effectiveness. Um, first, Look back at the health plans that you're working with to identify opportunities uh, around patient-centered medical homes. Um, secondly, uh, push your health plans to get the most out of the PCMHs. Um, we've got lots of PCMH programs that, that maybe have been, have been started by, um, by a group of, of practices, um, health plans um, may be willing to, to offer that set of benefits, um, but, but maybe aren't advertising, marketing of the opportunities as, as much as they could be, or the employer them, themselves isn't marketing those opportunities to their employees. Um, I, I think it's fascinating to look at MGM's experience and to see that shift over time uh, toward, toward the PCMH uh, model. One of the things that employers can do is they can offer first dollar primary care coverage um, or, or at least reduce cost sharing when uh, employers, excuse me, employees seek care in, in a PCMH. And, and that we are finding um, to be a, an increasing uh, incentive um, that you spoke to. We've got all kinds of incentives for, for providers, but not often do we have enough incentives for, for patients slash employees to embrace this model. This is a, this is a significant and important um, benefit uh, and incentive uh, to, to do just that. Um, the fourth item was to promote tra transparency, uh, to drive members, employees, uh, to, to the top providers. Um, and you can do that through lots of different means. Um, uh, again, I'd point you back to the issue brief to give you some examples. MGM was, was uh, the one we highlighted today. Um, using contracting, lots of communication, networks, um, lots of different experiences that various employers um, have in, in uh, successfully promoting transparency. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, this, this notion of direct contracting with, with patient-centered medical home uh, providers. Um, if you've got a large uh, employee base, uh, we see some, some terrific things happening uh, in, in the Seattle area. For example, um, uh, Erica Bliss and, and uh, um, her organization uh, looking at uh, all kinds of opportunities with unions, with employers, um, with, with, uh, with individuals. Um, 
we've got one of my former students uh, right here in Lawrence, Kansas, um, doing direct contracting uh, with, with his patients and uh, doing a fantastic job. Uh, there are some differences between direct con contracting uh, and concierge medicine that, that are important to point to. A top of that list is, is the cost for, for being able uh, to have that kind of access. So uh, for folks who, who are interested, um, there's a lot more um, growing information uh, about the evidence for direct contracting. And, and then, as I mentioned earlier, of uh, multi-payer PCMH collaboratives. Um, we've got them um, happening at, at the behest of the federal government um, relative to the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative. Uh, states have long been leading in, in this space. Um, the the MAPSIP uh, initiative, um, but as I mentioned earlier, those healthcare purchasing coalitions uh, are also um, doing lots of work in, in the private sector that, that um, are important. Um, part of the reason I'm talking so loud is it there are questions they're not showing up on on my screen so um, I do I do um, we're at the top of the hour and maybe Fatima if you've got questions or, or Amanda questions that you can see on your screen your screen um, that 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 we could ask uh, b before we end the webinar mine just showed that it's blank and I think that that's um that's a technical error Yes, thank you so much, Marcy and Brenna and Matt. This is Fatima Salam. Um, we actually have a, 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 quite a few questions, so we probably will only be able to get to a few. Um, but I, I will start off with one of our audience members um, wanted to know if the um, the incentives, the peer incentives uh, that that MGM uh, bonuses for their providers. Is any of the cost or quality information uh, tools available online for patients? Uh, your members to do any comparisons, or is that an internal um, aspect of the program? Uh, that, that's an internal aspect. So what we do is uh, we use TrueVin's uh, risk uh, calculation in order to uh, make a risk adjustment, adjusted estimated cost for each PCP's panel. And then we weigh the overall cost, not just within their office, but for you know, inpatient stays and prescriptions, we, we include all of that and we compare their actual cost to that expected risk-based cost and determine an overall cost efficiency. And when it comes to the rank, their ranking against their peers, that, that factors in at about a 20% weight along with the quality and access measures. Great, thank you. We're going to try to be squeezing another one. Um, when MGM created its medical home network, were you uh, putting that together yourself, or were you accessing um, other insurance other insurance carriers' networks to sort of put this together? Uh, we started with the existing network that we had in place for our self-funded PPO plan, and then uh, worked with the network to to have them agree to, that we could use their network without any of the primary care and then we replace the primary care component with direct contracts. Oh, great. Um, let's see. I think we're at the top of the hour, and I feel horrible we didn't get yet. We weren't able to get to uh, so many questions. But for those of you who did submit questions, we're going to do our very best to forward those on to Brenna and Matt, and hopefully we can get you some, um, some answers to those questions um, at a later date. And that, Martha, and I would you like to, to everybody? I should have known that there were questions. Um, they just were <laughs> showing up on my screen. No, I, I want to thank everybody. Um, it was a terrific presentation, and um, we will. I, I look forward to reading the questions and following back up with, with, with Brenna and and Matt, and uh, having perhaps another webinar uh, to follow on to this one. Thank you all so much. Thank Great. you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.